Lucas, Victor, and uh, Carousel team for inviting me here. And so very kindly hosting the, uh, uh, the book signing. So it's my first ever book signing. It's my fourth book. Not fourth book on go. It's my first book on go. But it's the first time I ever did a book signing. Uh, so, yeah. So that's, that's what it is. Um, so, um, I'm working with Singapore Power today. And I think there were, there are probably a lot of people asking me, why Singapore Power? It's kind of a long answer, which one I want to elaborate. But basically, I'm, I'm building uh, new digital products for Singapore Power. So, uh, stay tuned. There will be more things coming. But anyway, I was saying that uh, it's not my first, it's not my um, fourth book on Go, because I did about three other books on Ruby, but just one other book on Go, one book on Go, and that's the one. That's the one you see over there at the uh, uh, other side as well, the counter. Uh, We're doing two lucky draw books, so there are two physical books. And I also got my publisher to give like two more discount codes for uh, few books so you can get like two more free uh, think ebooks you can go in and you can get like hundred percent discount <clears throat> so that's that and, and I also have a discount code for you guys uh, towards the end of my talk so that's to encourage you to stay on <laughs> <laughs> right so um, just a bit of a warning for you first so um, to set expectations this is an introductory talk about uh, writing go applications but you should already know how to write Go application. So how many of you here know Go? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. The rest just really terribly shy or really good to go. Because it might get a bit hard to wait. You know? But it's not that difficult. It's just that if you don't know Go at all, you might some of the code might be a little bit puzzling. So are we good to go? Um, so again, it's introductory talk, so it's not going to go into a lot of details. You will find some more details in my book, hint, hint. But uh, at the same time, um, even my book is, is kind of an introductory, uh, yeah, introductory topics. I will be covering like, the first few chapters of it. Uh, the details are in there, but nonetheless, the, the, my talk here is uh, really uh, introductory, and even the book is not really in that. So it's like an intermediate book. Okay. So having said that and putting all the disclaimers, so I'll ask the first question. Uh, what are our applications? Anyone wants to venture a guess? How many have you done web applications before? Everyone? How many have not done web applications? Okay. So there are a few of them. So actually those who have not done our web applications should be perfect for you. Uh, those of you who have done web applications but probably haven't done it in Go, then this will be more suitable. For those of you who have already done Go and already done web applications, I don't know what you're doing here. <laughs> you're not probably going to learn a lot of things new. Uh, but anyway, so any quick answer to what web applications are? For those who have done web applications before? So anyway, um, in a room that I asked this, right, um, where I sort of did this talk before, many people have different definitions of what applications are. Uh, basically, I have my own definition of what applications are. I think for some, say, uh, a React.js application is a web application, Angular and so on, that's JavaScript client-side web application. I'm more referring to the server-side applications. Right, so that's, that's what I'm going to talk about today. And that's what I will consider a web application. So essentially, this is a web application. You have a client and you have a server. The client sends the HTTP request to the server. The server sends certain information like the request line, the request headers, followed by an empty line, and then the message body, which is optional. Uh, then the server returns with a status line which says uh, OK, no OK, no found, whatever. Then a uh, certain set of response headers, empty line, finally a message body, if any. Right. So you notice one thing straight out is like uh, the request and the response are very similar. Yeah. Uh, and that's deliberate. This is basically HTTP. So in case you are 
why are we talking about this at all? So web application is all about HTTP. Right? In fact, um, if, you, if you read the protocol, you probably know uh, what web applications are all about. Really. So pro tip on writing web applications, understand the protocol, and then a lot of systems are very much clear. Okay. So what does a web application do? So you can send a, if you, or you can't see that, but you say server, you yeah. um, <laughs> Yes, trust me. So, you get a server, you send in a request. First, you will process the request. You will execute the application logic, the logic of how you want the, the server to process your request, or the incoming request. And then you generate a response. And finally, you send the response back to the, so to the client. It's, that's it. That's what a web application does. And everything, of course, lies in the second part, right? So. Whatever you want to achieve is all done in the second part. The first part and the third part are mostly done by frameworks, done by uh, application language, whatever it is. And that's basically what I'm going to show you today. These are the two main parts. Again, what are the parts of a web location? <coughs> you have a multiplexer, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the multiplexer, which does filtering and directing of a request. A handler, uh, which processes a request. Uh, template engine, which will um, generate the uh, response content, and this is really normally not part of a web application, but persistence is so prevalent in web applications, I just put it out there. It's in my book, but it's not in uh, the talk today, because it's really not part of the web. Right? It is, you can actually write web applications that do not store anything, and that's quite common as well. Um, but it is also very common to have a database system. If you look at a bigger picture, this is what it is. Kind of uh, messy at the first glance. Uh, but the server part, you have the multiplexer, you have the template engine, the templates, the handlers, and the models, you're doing persistence. Of course, if you're not doing persistence, that's where it ends. Uh, and then the, the template engine normally sends a response back to the client. All right? So, too simple, too complex so far. Everyone okay? Okay, so that's what a web application is. But what does Go have? What does Go do for you? The Go does two things for you. Uh, it does net HTTP and does HTML template. So this is what Go does for you. What every what uh, else Go does is other other the body libraries. But really, you can write entire web applications and the web servers just with these two things. In fact. Most of my book just talks about these two things. In fact, I rarely talk about anything else other than that. And that's deliberate because um, there are many reasons why I like using Go for writing web applications. And the main one, which is my favorite, is that I only need to use these two things. I don't need to use anything else to write web applications. Right. Finally, even for deployment, I don't need to use um, anything else. I don't need to, say, use a web logic right, to deploy my Java war files, right, uh, to my EJPs, right. Um, I don't need like a Puma server to deploy my, my, my Ruby application. I don't need anything else. I just need Go. There's two standard libraries which are built to Go. You write the program and off you go. Right? You're not laughing, man. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so this is what um, NetHTTP has. Um, so the NetHTTP actually has two parts, right? So one part is the client, the other side is the server. So you can actually write HTTP servers using NetHTTP, you can write the HTTP clients using uh, NetHTTP as well, right? In fact, if you never actually return, um, you never actually return HTML, which is actually what many applications uh, do if you are talking about the web services, you never use any. You never need to use anything else except NetHTTP. HTML template is only necessary if you are returning HTML. Okay. So why go web applications? I talk about um, my the, my favorite reason, but there are other reasons. It's a single standalone binary, easily deployable, compiles to different platforms, uh, different uh, systems, different CPUs, whatever, uh, scalable. So this is quite interesting. Um, each incoming connection is handled by a separate Go team. Right. So I did a, a very idle, was idle, and I was like trying to do some uh, testing in terms of uh, scalability. 
of a Ruby application and a, a Go web application. Right? So I wrote the same application and uh, configured Puma, which is one of the faster uh, Ruby servers. And then I configured it to 32 threads and let it rip. Right? So I scaled the number of connections to it so it grows for a short while. And after that tapered, everything pretty stable. Right? 32 threads, which means after 32 threads is done, you're done. Right? It just remains at 32. Stable. Nothing happened. Go. I ran the same thing so it scaled and keep rising and keep rising and keep rising past the 32 tracks, keep rising and rising and rising. It's linear. Up to a certain point, holding <laughs> crash and dies. Right. So what happened? Uh, so basically, you just keep on spinning proteins up to a certain point where it runs out of memory or the system can't take it anymore and then it will just die. Right. So, so is it good? Is it bad? Uh, I didn't actually do any exception catching. Right? I didn't expect it to just die. Uh, so I didn't do anything. But the, um, so you were using Ruby using Puma, it's stable, the two threads, but if you don't want to use Go, just be a bit careful because you could run into this problem if you try to escape. If you don't do any exception catching, right? So you need to actually uh, maybe cache your, your connection somewhere. So not let it spin up and go with you. Right? So that's what it is. Alright, let's begin. We'll look at the uh, simplest web application. This is it. Just a few lines. If for those who are new to Go, which I think some of you are, um, all Go applications need to have a main package. So the package main, you import a library, that's the library I talked about just now, and then like any nice application, you need to have a main. You start up the server by saying HTTP listen and serve. Nothing else, you have a web application. Of course it does completely nothing at all, because it just exists. Uh, it won't do any good for you, it won't return anything. So let's look at something. No, okay, sorry. Package. Um, import another library. Right, let's look at something a little bit more complicated. So let's say I want to start up at uh, port 8080. So I set up the address, uh, put colon 8080. There's no handler again. Server listen and serve, so it serves up, but nothing will happen because there's no handler. Right? It won't return anything. Something is listening there, but will not do anything for you because it's not considered to do anything. Right, so you have a complete global but there's no security handles. So let's do something serious now. Um, let's route the request. So back to the picture to make it nice and visual. This is what I'm talking about, like the multiplexer. Uh, so this is a simple web application. Right, it's a, with a one basic handler. Let's look at it step by step. First, you need to define a struct. Then you need to attach a method to the struct. Okay. And then you create the instance of the handler. You attach the handler instance to the server, as a reference to a handler to the server. And then you're done. Right? So this is a simple application. What does it do? Hello world. Hello world. Right? Simple, right? Easily understood. But it seems like a lot of lines of code to write a hello world, right? That's like why. Um, let's put it on more lines of code. Okay? But that's just only one handler. That's what why. Your application can only do one thing. That's kind of useless. Let's do more things. Um, let's say if I go slash hello, you say hello, or slash world, it's goes world. So here um, I define two structs, two methods, which returns two things, two different things. And then, um, yeah, so here I am not specifying the handler um, because it defaults to something called default server mounts. So default multiplexer. So the multiplexer, what it does is it looks at the URL that you're looking for and then if you um, use something called http.handle and attach the handler to that particular route, it will call that, that uh, method, right? Uh, you call it handler, sorry. Right. So this is how you do multiple handlers. Again, it's like, hmm, if I have a bigger application, 
there's a lot of struts and there's a lot of methods attached to struts, right? So again, you notice that um, every method that's attached to the strut has a method called surf HTTP. It's a standard method. So all handlers must have this particular method with this particular method solution. Okay. But it is all software. Let's look at something else. Um, yeah, so it's specified in URL. So this is a lot smaller, a lot shorter, a lot fewer lines of code. How does this work? So no more structs. You just define a function with a specific signature. So this is the convenience method. So it's a shorter way of writing it. So ultimately what happens is um, Go itself translates this into what you saw just now with the two things. But this is written a lot simpler. And how does this work? work? Um, you define the, the functions and you specify the handler. Again, this uses default server marks. Right? Pretty simple. Uh, that's default server marks. You can change your multiplexer. Yeah, you're using the default multiplexer that comes in Go. It is relatively powerful, but it's not very fanciful. Right? If you want to do more stuff, you have to do a lot more passing yourself. If not, then you will um, change to a different multiplexer. Write your own multiplexer or use some other multiplexer. Okay, so that's a uh, routing request. Let's move on a little bit. How to process the request. So again, to make it more visual, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, these are the handlers that will do the work for you. Right? So exactly what work was that's defined by an application. Um, let's look at this. Simple web form. Notice that I'm using this, this is the default value, but if you know HTML forms, this is the default encryption type that's been used. You don't have anything, but you can actually use something else as well. And that is actually important. Uh, in the URL, I pass some parameters in the URL. Of course, normally you wouldn't do that, but I'm just showing you that this is possible. You will also have some data passing from form view. Right? So how do you get this data? Basically, your HTML form is sending a bunch of data to your server. How do you get the data from the server? At, at the server. Okay, so very simply, you use the request, that dot form, what do you get? So you pass the form first. You need to call this method to pass the form. This is what you get. You get a map. Right? And this map has a number of things. So it has a uh, thread, we say it's one, two, three. Hello, which has uh, a slice of two values, South Shell in the world, and then uh, post with four, five, six. Now, if I go back here, you notice I have hello, because world, thread, one, two, three, in the URL parameters, and then in the form fields, I actually have hello, South Shell, and post four, five, six. So in other words, I when I call pass form and then I call r.form, basically it takes everything in both the URL and the form field and then gives you a map. Right? And then after that you can do whatever you want. Uh, question. So yep. uh, it, the, it was a post request just now, right? So mm -hmm. but the URL parameters are counted as uh, Yes, you're right. You will take both. Yeah, and it, they just translate to a single map. Yes. Would you be able to differentiate between a post or a get in the map? I swear I did not plan in there. Because it's exactly what I'm going to do next. So this is on URL parameter, this is your form field. Um, let's say I change this to multi-part. Okay, uh, I'll get to that in the short while. I'll explain to that uh, towards the end of this thing. Um, if I change the multi-part, and why do you think I change the multi-part? Because I'm double-file. double right? So this is about it's the classic set of the So let's look at this at the server side. You need to, again, pass the form, but you need to say pass multi-part, and specify how much data you pass. And then you get the file from the form. I'm showing you the more the, the longer form formats. They are actually shortcuts. 
methods to all these guys. Uh, I'm showing you the longer form. Uh, and I don't want to have too many slides, so I'll only show you some parts of it. But they are shorter form, and I'll show you in the short form. Um, so very easily, you just get a file, and then you can do whatever you want in the file. Like you can read it, you can manipulate it, you can store it in the database, whatever you want. Um, another, another much easier one, you just combine passing and retrieving to one, one method call. And this applies to many of the other methods I showed here as well. So again, this is the, to answer your question just now. Um, how do I differentiate? So there are, there are certain um, fields, like form, you get from post form, you get from multi-part form, and then there are uh, fields like form value and post form value. If you want to get from the URL, you want to say this is from the URL, oops. then uh, you can call pass form and you can call form value. If you want to just get from post, then you call post form and you call the form. Right? You want to get URL encoded, you can get it from here. You want to get the multi part, you want to get a file, you call multi part form. It's a bit convoluted. But uh, once you understand how this works, it's actually not as as complicated. What if we search URL just to get request? Uh, mm -hmm. What would be the way to just get a query, but first? You can you can use form. Yeah, so uh, yeah. Okay. It's counterintuitive. The naming is much is higher. Or you can actually get from the, the request. You can get the URL and you pass it yourself. You can do that as well. I didn't show everything right, because there are so many possibilities. And uh, I mean, otherwise, you spend the whole night here talking about different possibilities. But really, uh, you can either use form, which is a little bit faster. You can actually use like uh, form value, right? And uh, you can just get the form value, just give the name, and then you get it directly. There are, there are shortcuts to it. Okay, so that's that. Um, then the next one is generating the response content. And this is what I'm going to talk about, basically templates and the template engine. So template engines, um, the rationale is very simple, right? What are template engines? So uh, template engines, what it does is it takes the template, it takes the data, collapse, collapse it together and send it out as the data and the final HTML. Right? So in principle, this is what it does. You look at uh, the template engines like Mustache, right? uh, you look at say PHP, GSP, Essentially, this is the data, you got the template, you put it together, and you give it as HTML, or JSON, or whatever you want. Right? It doesn't really matter, XML, or whatever. So that's how you, uh, that's the, the function of a uh, template engine. Um, there are certainly two types, generally two types of uh, uh, template engines. One which is logicless, and one is uh, embedded logic. The embedded logic ones that you can do your know, ETLs kind of thing. It, the other one is like very strict. You just put data in it, you can't do anything else. Okay. So, uh, where does the Go template engine lie? Which is somewhere in between. Somewhere. And like most things, it's like neither here. Neither like completely one side or the other side. And if you go a little bit more into Go, you can find this everywhere. Like Go works wherever it's the most efficient and most. Uh, it doesn't really care whether, whether how many types they are. It doesn't follow strictly to one thing or the other. So, this template engine. Um, look at this template. This is a template. And look at this uh, two curly braces to the left, two curly braces to the right, and then a dot in the middle. So dot basically replaces the value. So this is the anything that's between these two double braces is called action. Yeah. So would, would this clash with AngularJS? Since AngularJS is also mm -hmm. data binding with double curly. So this is at the uh, server side. Also, they will pass it. You can. But, but let's say if I return. Oh yeah, you put it. Like JavaScript. Yeah. You, this it, it will clash by default, but you can specify that you can change it to a uh, different thing. You can say like double angle background. You can double like whatever square bracket. You can change the the, the bracket. It doesn't need to be braced. It's braces by default, but you can change it to something else uh, that you can specify up front. Uh, came out once. Somebody asked me about this one. Uh, so this is called, called an action. The dot is the replacement value. You, re 
interfaces, whatever you send to the template to be combined together. And, uh, this is how it goes. Um, HTML template, you need to import it now. So first, you need to pass the template file. Your file, it can be a string. It doesn't need to be a file itself. Of course, I'm calling pass file, so it's a bit more file. But you can actually pass the string. And once you pass the template in, the T, T becomes template. And then the next thing I do is um, I execute the pass template and send data to the template to be combined. And then I send it output to response writer. Response writer is the view. The view. Right? Everything else is the same. So what kind of actions can you do? Actually, there are a lot of actions you can do. Uh, these are some of the uh, more well-used templates. I'm uh, sorry, actions. The dot, just a uh, value replacement. Conditional is so you can do the if and then range is an iterator. Uh, set, you can set a particular variable to a particular value. Uh, you can do templates. So you can include a template within the template within the template. Within the template. So it can be very like inception, I can go to multiple levels. Uh, on the first time I used this, I thought it was like, wow, that's really very basic. There's nothing much you can do. Actually, there are a lot of tricks that you can play with this. And uh, I found out that it's actually very powerful. The templating engine is very powerful. It's not as intuitive because you are used to certain ways of uh, using template engines. But it can be pretty powerful. Okay. So, Let's look at range, just to give an example. Uh, template file iterator. It's the range action and uh, it's a dot action. So I pass the file, uh, temp temple.html, and then I pass it based on the week as in the slice and I send it across. And this is what I get. So look at this again. Range days of the week, and then within that range, you will do a replacement for every element, and this is what you get. Right? It's a book. And they're all like that, somewhat like that. Okay, so um, next thing is functions, uh, custom functions. Go, Go Template Engine has basic functions, and the uh, main basic is really, really basic, essentially. Quite trivial, it's like print lines and stuff like that. Things that you normally would not think would be very really useful, but there it is. Right? It has a very basic set of functions. The good thing is, the good news is you can create custom functions, your own functions, and then send it to the uh, uh, template to be used in the template engine. Okay, so this is how it goes. Uh, first, you need to create your function. Let's say this function basically formats time to a particular layout that I want. Okay. Um, then I create a function map. So map template .fun map, which is basically the method you call to create a function. And then I name it, right? I name the format date, which is function I have. I call it F date. Right. Next I add the function map to the template by calling the funs method. And that's it. You can use your template as normal, and inside your template, you can call a custom function. Okay? You notice this funny little dot then pipeline. How, how does that work? So you use pipelining to send data as parameters to the function. Right? You, you can actually call it the normal way, but you don't use any brackets. It's kind of funny, but this is kind of interesting because you can pipe. So we can pipe from one to another, you can dot to F date to another function to another function to another function. It's just like you put it. Right, so this function comes up with uh, this particular uh, result. Right. We format it into this. Yeah, this is kind of based on my book. <laughs> That's why the graphics is not that great. Okay. Uh, right, so what's next? So one interesting feature in uh, Go template engine is that templates are context aware, which means the um, the content that's finally produced, the HTML is finally produced, 
depends on where it's placed. Okay, so let me show you. So here, um, again, simple template pass files, template, and send it to content. The content here has angular brackets, has uh, single code, double code, question mark, forward slash, and so on, right? So this is sent to a template. This is normal. You've seen this before, this is normal. I send the data to display. Now I look at this, I put it as part of the URL's hierarchical part, I put it as URL query, and put it as JavaScript, but I put the same data, right? They're all dots. The content that comes out actually is something different altogether. So again, you look here, it's the original text, I ask what's up, and uh, if it's a normal thing, it's URL encoded, but you put in the href something different, you put it as part of the query, again, something different, you put it as JavaScript, it actually converts to something. You don't need to do anything, it actually does this for you. It, you can actually disable this, but this is like a safeguard for you in case you know you write something that's not so safe, right? Like, uh, or some people put in some uh, cross site scripting attacks. It's supposed to be like, it's not foolproof because you can actually disable this, but nonetheless, it's a uh, interesting feature in the template engine. Alright, so that's a very whirlwind introduction to the Go uh, programming language for developing web applications. And uh, it's promise, that's just count code. It expires on the 31st of August, so uh, anytime from now to then. I think they, uh, yeah, so they're giving 39%. Why 39? But yeah, anyway, the publisher gave me this discount code. For, especially for this event, um, to the end of the month, you get 39% off. Right? Again, there are two books, physical books for Lucky Draw, and two books that are books, which I did not include here, so I'll get the names, get your email, I'll send it to you. All right? Questions? Yeah. Yeah. I saw you like to say there is a go routing, right? Uh, go go routing. routing, yeah. Yes. So what's the difference between the go routing and the fly? Could you specify that? I think uh, because that uh, go is more like a mm. like like the Java style thing, not not like no JS, right? Not single thread. So the graphing is more like a thread, right? In, in, in the in the in the Go language. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Go routines are like lightweight threads. Yeah. yeah right. So, so what's the difference between the uh, graphing and the uh, uh, thread? It's a lightweight thread. Lightweight thread. Yeah. It's just much smaller footprint than a normal thread. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, another another question is about uh, which scenario do you think is most suitable for Go to to deploy the public application? So, um, to be honest, if you ask me, is it a great uh, language to write web applications, I mean, full fledged HTML and everything like right? I would say it's okay, it's reasonable, but where it really shines is for deploying web services. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on, the on the server side. On the server side. So, you can, the tablet engine is really powerful. But again, like I said, if there are actually tools that are better, right? uh, there are tools which are a lot worse, of course. Uh, the tools that are better. So it's somewhere in the middle. I would say where it shines, where I personally think it shines is in uh, writing web services. Writing web services. Yeah. Okay, well, it's, it's usually the request response to JSON source, and then the request response to template. Also, you won't use template. You will just convert your struct. Because normally you will deal with struct. And you just convert the struct to JSON, and then you just image. Uh, yeah. You don't ever need to use HTML. Yeah. This is actually not meant for that. So it supports sockets at all already? What do you mean? Uh, like, uh, web sockets. Web sockets? Uh, so, so does it all support web sockets? I am yeah. not familiar with web sockets, so I can't be that. I can check it out. I don't really know. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 So, so is this console? There was a question again. So it's not Yep. Do you recommend us using the default server, server box or it's best to try on Oh, use default server box. It's actually pretty good. There are other multiplexes. Um, there's one I used some time back in score HTTP 